Hello everybody, last year I sat down with Michael, the son of an Essex farmer and a petrol head who found himself in the right place at the right time to experience some of the greatest cars in history. From the Ford GT to the Lamborghini Miura, these are icons that today are considered some of the best ever and frequently command multi-million pound price tags. I first met Michael around eight years ago, shortly after he'd launched his first book, Let Them Stare, a recollection of his memories from his time and what he thought of these cars as they were in a period. It has to be easily one of the most enjoyable pieces of motoring writing that I've read and a brutally honest account of what it was like to own these cars back in the day when they weren't so highly sought after. In the wake of the interview that we did, I am delighted to say that we managed to sell out the entirety of the remainder of his print run for both the first book and its follow-up, Let Them Stare Again. And for that, both Michael and I want to say a huge thank you, because your efforts have now helped to raise more than £20,000 for a children's hospice that is very close to Michael's heart. In the wake of that video, Michael got back in touch and said, James, I'm absolutely astounded at how well it's done, but I feel a little bit silly because I now realise there are a whole bunch of cars and stories that I've just left out. Do you think your followers would like to hear a little more? Now, I, I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I answered on your behalf and I said, Michael, yes, they would love to. And so, to celebrate the release of this new book, made from the contents of both the first and second, available directly from Michael for £20, and with a very kind mention to me on the back, we are going to present here an extended director's cut of that first video. I've sat down with Michael for a couple of extra sessions and we've recorded a whole bunch of new stories, including some about cars you haven't heard of before. And uh, <clears throat> I know what's to come and I assure you, whether you've seen this interview before or not, I know you're gonna enjoy this one. So then, all that remains for me is really a big thank you once again, and now we'll get the titles rolling, then after that, we'll hand you over to Michael. I was born on March 23rd, 1947, at our Essex farmhouse um, on the edge of Sybil Headingham. I actually lived there with the family and my brother for 25 years. My brother was born three years after me and we then had what can be considered as an idyllic childhood. We weren't into cars. Our first interest was aeroplanes because the farm bordered RAF Wethersfield where in the early 50s, there were 7,000 American personnel, and we used to go up with a picnic and a dog, climb over the perimeter fence, sit down, and we watched these planes coming back from Korea, where the Americans were having a bit of a scrap. So we, we, we loved the Sabres, the Super Sabres, the F-104 Starfighters, the F-105 Thunder Chiefs, and they were coming back in a terrible state. I mean, they were, you could see they'd been hit they were all smoking, so how they got back from Korea, I'll never ever know. A bit of a light bulb moment in 1960. The government decreed that all cars over 10 years old should have a Ministry of Transport test, what we call the MOT. My dad said he was quite keen that we drove around because we'd been driving tractors since we were eight. And in those days, tractors had two seats. And the, the David Brown tractor, I sat in the passenger seat with one of the, with the chaps that was working on the farm. And we just loved it. Dad went to the local garage, 1960, Gibson's garage in Swan Street, Sybil Headingham, and said to the, the, the owner, what's happening to all these cars that are failing the MOT? The chap said, well, we've been told to scrap them. So Dad said to him, if you get a car that's failed an MOT but is working and it's failed just because of rust, let me know, we might be keen on having a few of them. So they agreed a price of what is the 30 bob, which is today £1.50, for this, these wrecks of cars. And the first car we ever got, I thought, was an Austin 7. I was 13, brother was 10. So we were roaring around in this thing until it virtually fell to bits. When I printed my first book, a chap contacted me from Australia 
And he said, oh, by the way, that isn't an Austin 7. He said, that is a one of three very early Jensen's. And I thought, my goodness, we'd had a Jensen, thrashed it to bits. Of course, we didn't know it at the time. The next car we had was a Riley Monaco, which again has become quite valuable. And our best and fastest was something called a Vauxhall 6, which was really quick, six cylinder. And we would just roar around the fields because we had a, a, a herd of 80 cows, so we had plenty of pasture. When the cows weren't in there, we were in with the car. And we started then to change our views from aeroplanes to cars. And we got Dad interested as well. So it was a, it was a good start, and I suppose up to, the, up to the age of 10 years old, we, um, we were a happy family. Uh, we had a nanny, Mildred, who looked after us. And as a matter of fact, she looked after my dad when he was born as well. So she taught us a few things about life. And I think that upbringing made us very, my brother and I, quite confident. And we got the feeling that adversity that was obviously going to come sooner or later in life, we could deal with. And I think um, through life, we've often thought back, you know, we were so lucky. But it wasn't a hugs and kisses family. You know, it was quite formal, a little bit of deference. Um, I, when I went to boarding school, and my brother and I went to boarding school when we were nine, we'd come back, see Dad, he'd shake our hand and said, hello, son. And I don't ever remember him calling me Michael, actually, in all the years he was alive. So we were happy, but we were happy at a distance. He liked Fords. We had a Ford Consul. Uh, we then had a Ford 105e Anglia. And then we started to get more interested in cars, so we went for a Sunbeam Rapier second-hand one. It didn't turn out to be a good car, but we liked the rapier. So Dad part exchanged that car for a Series 4 rapier in gold, which was a lovely looking thing. And we then thought, oh, can we make it faster? So Dad was becoming a bit of a petrol head. So we took the car down to Jack Brabham's garage in Chessington in Surrey for a conversion. Cylinder head done, had a special exhaust, and I, I don't know whether the camshaft was changed. It came back quicker and it came back noisier, so we were quite happy, but it was quite expensive. So one of the first journeys out after the conversion was to see a film in Braintree at the Embassy Cinema, and it was called How the West Was Won. And it was a film, that, the first film where sound surround, massive screen, loved it. So me, Dad and my brother. On the way home, we're going out of Braintree on Broad Road and we get lights hard behind us. So brother looked round, he said, Dad, that's a Lotus Cortina. Dad hadn't heard of a Lotus Cortina. This was 1963, it had just been announced. Dad said, well, we'll show him. So we went out towards Gosfield. Dad put his foot down and this Lotus Cortina came by us as though we were standing still. Dad didn't speak, none of us could talk, wasn't mentioned again. Next morning, Dad was on the phone to our local Ford dealer in Haverhill called Cleels Limited. And he knew the manager there quite well. And it's just so happened that the manager had a Lotus Cortina as his company car. We dealt with Cleels from the farm because, you know, we had 500 acres, 80 cows, and we did need an agricultural merchant to buy stuff from, and we used Cleels. And anyway, we borrowed this car for three days. We were blown away, 105 brake horsepower, five and a half inch wide wheels, and a good looking machine. So we decided, we decided to order a car. So the Mark I Lotus Cortina had um, aluminium doors, boot and bonnet, and, a, and a, what they call an A-bracket rear axle, but we, ordered, it was the Mark II of the first series, and that had uh, no aluminium boot and doors, but it had got this A-bracket suspension, and that cost £995 brand new. So we used that for a while, uh, but there was problems with these rear axles. The rear axle went back and it was changed. But what my brother and I did, which was quite naughty at the time, uh, mum and dad used to go to Ibiza every year before it became trendy. So my brother and I, at night, used to take the car out. So this was 1966, so I was, what, 18 or 19, brother a bit less. And we were lucky because the farm was surrounded by a three miles of road with no houses. We'd go out, roll around, and we came back one day, parked it up in the garage, 
but it, there was a thud. Something had broken, so we left it there, shaking like a leaf, went back to bed, because this is one o'clock in the morning, and um, Dad came back from holiday, got in the car, ooh, wouldn't move. And what had happened was that this rear axle, this A-bracket suspension rear axle, had broken. So he rings up the dealer. The dealer says to him, oh, we've had a lot of trouble with these. We'll come and change, take the car back under warranty and change the rear axle to the new type. So he never actually knew that we'd been out and breaking it. When my brother and I were in our very early teens, our allegiance changed from planes to cars. But we're talking now early 60s, and there wasn't that many supercars to get excited about. In fact, really, there was only Ferrari, because um, there was Maserati, but they were in the background. Astons didn't really appeal to me. But we sort of thought, well, Ferrari's the way to go. So we started getting Ferrari books, at, even at that level you know, that age. We had nice Ferraris on the wall, but this was the era when only really the short wheelbase was around. Lamborghini hadn't really come into existence then. I think the uh, Mura came out in 65, and that was the beginning of the Lamborghini era. So we didn't really, at our, in our youth, have those to, uh, you know, to f sort of fawn over. But um, definitely Ferrari pictures on the wall, and Dad and I, we used to go to the Earl's Court Motor Show every year which was a long trip from Essex, no M11. We used to drive up, it used to take about three hours, park at Earl's Court. And what I would do as a sort of nerd, I'd go around all the stands um, picking up brochures, most of which I still have. And the Ferrari stand, there was a man that stopped you going on. So Dad had to have a word in all the time. Come in, you know, we want to have a look round. Then we wanted to go on the Lamborghini stand where the 350 GT, I think, had just been announced. And um, Dad said, my son wants to look under the bonnet. And he was sort of shocked. And we just stood there and he said, well, I'll, I'll go and ask. So he went away and came back. He says, the manager says, yes, you can look under the bonnet. So we got there and that's the first V12 I've ever seen. So that was my excitement as a 13 year old or 14 year old to see my first V12. So the bonnet was lifted up. We had a look round, blah, 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 and put the lid down. Of course, what I didn't know was in the years to come, I'd have one of these cars and I would have liked to tell the bloke to stop me going on the stand. The first legitimate car that we, I drove was a Morris 1000 pickup because I passed my test a couple of months after the um, 17th birthday. So say May 60, whatever it was, 64. I'd had uh, driving lessons in a Mini, I think which were about 15 shillings an hour at 75p. And strangely on the test day, we were going down the high street and I saw ahead a woman with a wheelchair with a baby in it and she came out between some cars. I'd slammed on the brakes quicker than the instructor because it was dual control and we'd been out only on the road about five minutes and he says you've passed and we went back. So that was my test. A bit of a fluke but it worked well so I, dad said well what we'll do is we'll buy a farm vehicle so you can start to learn to drive so it was a Morris 1000 pickup and um, I used that for six or seven months really just to get the hang of the road. I left school when I was 16. I wasn't bright enough to do A-levels. I came back and I worked on the farm for a couple of years, but it wasn't really my scene. You know, I was getting on a tractor in the morning, ploughing 30 acres with a, a two-furrow plough, which takes a long while. And I said to Dad, um, I'm quite keen to get into the garage business so he said well we'll have a look round he was very keen that I didn't borrow money from anybody except the family his mantra was banks are fine weather friends and he mentioned this quite a lot so initially when um, I wanted something better than the Morris Thousand pickup I borrowed some money and then I bought a it was a Triumph Herald 1200 coupe Went down to, to look at it in Surrey, a place called Thornton Heath, bought it, drove it back. So I kept that for probably a year. But by that time, I put a wooden steering wheel on it because everybody bought accessories from Les Leston. Wooden steering wheel, stripes up the bonnet, um, just to sort of smarten it up a bit. And then from there, 
um, we went to, I went to a Triumph Spitfire, which was a 1964 Spitfire that I bought in 1966. So I was getting into cars, and so I said, you know, I'm really keen to get into the garage business. And we had a local village to us called Blackmore End, and there was a garage came up for sale. A normal garage pumps the lot, so that was 1971 and it was £8,000. So I borrowed the money from Dad and I bought the garage, which I had for 11 years, and that was really the beginning of the real petrol head stuff. So 1971, we buy the garage, which was a, a terrible wreck of a place. It was called Old School Garage, Blackmore in Braintree. And we spent quite a lot of time and money getting it together, um, refurbishing it. I then uh, looked round to employ mechanics. So I employed two mechanics to start. We didn't have an MOT station, we had to do that locally. We didn't have what I would call any serious problems in all the 10 years, but it was a slog. And I think we only had really, I would say, three out of the 10 years where we were considered to be profitable. But it was an eye-opener because this is such a huge learning curve it was just useful also because I was starting to get interested in really nice cars and to have a garage would, would, it was, saved us so much money because you could do all the work yourself. I had a Lotus Elan S3 and I got wind of a Lusso, a Ferrari 250 GT Lusso that was for sale near Cambridge, not far away. So I made an appointment to see him on a Sunday morning, went over to see him and he's in a beautiful house in a village called Abingdon near Cambridge and had a look around the car. He wouldn't let me drive it because I was too young. So we drove, he drove me out towards Linton and Haverhill, telling me all the while that um, you'd never see another one on the road. You know, they only made 360 of them, you know, rare as hen's teeth, blah, 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 did the full sales pitch. And then we were just approaching Linton on the dual carriageway. On the other side of the dual carriageway, would you believe it, a blue, dark blue Luce was approaching. The registration number was PS1216. I'll always remember it because suddenly the chappie fell silent. You know, we'd seen another one, which is, I had, I had never seen another one on the road. So that was quite strange. And then years later, when I bought my GTB, I noticed in the chap's garage there was a picture on the wall of a dark blue Lusso, PS1216. So that belonged to Major Ian Yates all those years before. And so that was a bit of a strange coincidence. Anyway... The chap wanted 1800 for the car. I only had 1500 so we didn't do a deal. Um, and I think I was probably acting above my station a bit, really, wanting a Ferrari so early in life. Anyway, um, so that was that. That was 1970. 1971, we sold the farm. My brother and I had a word with Dad and just said, let's face it, he was the best dad in the world. And we said, look, there's a bit of money about now from the farm. We think we ought to buy a few proper cars and try and, you know, make some money. Retirement didn't suit him. We said to him, um, there was a very nice Ferrari GTO for sale in Cheshire, and it was £6,250. And he said, well, we'll go and look at it. At that time, Mum was moaning that she got a Mini and she could see it cars on the horizon. So... Dad and I went to London one day and we bought her a Sunbeam Tiger, the 4.2 litre Series 1 Sunbeam Tiger, uh, for £715. Bought it back, she loved it. So we then felt we were in a better position to buy some decent stuff ourselves. So Dad and I went to um, Cheshire, uh, a chap called Brian Classic had it for sale. It was a long trip, like f three and a half hours. Beautiful car, I didn't drive it. And Dad said, I don't like this bloke's accent. I said, I said, Dad, he's from the north. He said, yes, not only that, he said, but the car's Italian. He said, and Dad fought in the war in Burma and he was a bit anti-Italian. So I said, well, why didn't you say this before we went all the way up? He said, oh, it's a nice trip out. So we came back and years and years later, I found out that the car actually belonged to Colin Crabb and he had part exchanged it. So it was a famous car and today we know it'd be worth between 40 and 50 million. So that was a bit of an error. So then we said, well, can we buy a Ford? Oh, I love Fords. So my brother was working at Hexagon of Highgate 
exotic car dealers. It, this was the early 70s where we were having a petrol crisis, electrical pr crisis. At the garage, I had to shut the pumps off at three o'clock. And if people wanted petrol, we had to wind the, wind the pumps up. And that went on for quite a long while. It, it was a very dark period, to put it another way. So he rang, David rang one day, he said, oh, we've got a car coming in that we don't want. And it was a Ford GT40. So I said, well, I think we should certainly look at that car. He said, well, we're not going to take it in because that stuff is not selling at the moment, eight or nine miles to the gallon. You know, it stinks of petrol. Let's face it, it, it ran at Le Mans in 65 and it hadn't been changed. So I went up to look at the car in London. It belonged to a chap called Julian Seddon, who was a society photographer. And it, it was his second GT40. We went into this uh, lock-up garage, opened the door, and this amazing-looking GT40 was there. It was brown with gold stripes. So he said, well, well, let's go out. So we went out on a road above London called the West Way, backwards and forwards, and it was so quick. So we came back, and he wanted £5,000, and I said, well, you know, we can only go to four and four five. We agreed at 4,600. So the next day in the morning, I went to the bank because everything then was paid for with the banker's draft, which was safe money, and went up to London. And I'd never driven a GT40 before. We're in the middle of London, and it was a hot day. So we get in the car, say goodbye to him, blah, blah, blah. And I then set off down the embankment. There was traffic. I was just looking at all the dials, but it never got hot. And the reason why was it was running on Webers, which are a much better system on a GT40 than a Holly, Holly carburetor. So it never got hot. But you couldn't open the doors. You had a very small window that you could open on the side. So it was absolutely boiling. And of course, it's sort of the doors lift up. And I was every time we stopped in traffic, it was up. But we got home, or I got home, and Dad said, I thought you were buying a Ford. I said, well, it is a Ford, Dad. It's a Ford GT40. Oh, then that was the end of it. Took him around the roads, and he basically said, it's so uncomfortable, it's hot, but if you think it'll you know, do well in the years to come, you know, no problem. So that was, that was 71. We kept that for five years. Um, it wasn't a real problem. It wasn't satisfactory on the road. It wasn't a proper road car. It still had racing tires on. It turned out to be an iconic vehicle that people now would pay five, six million pounds for. So that was really the first entry into exotic cars. I had a, a girlfriend that I go and visit in Sudbury and I go through Castle Henningham and apparently the, all the tellies were going like this because it hadn't got whatever you're meant to have on a car to stop the electrical things it hadn't got. And so I was stopped one day, one morning actually, and the chap came out, very nice man, and he said, um, every time you go through the town, we know it's you because we lose, it goes, the tellies go bzzz, like this. So I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take it down to the electrical chap and get whatever he's doing. So he put whatever equipment, electrical equipment it was, and it stopped. Apart from that, um, we never had any ag from the police or anybody. And we used to go quite quick in it. But um, it was just a piece of life that probably I didn't appreciate at the time. But I now realise how lucky I was. Spring of 72, I was working for a six months at Weathersfield Air Base in their stores. And at the time, I had an Elan Sprint drophead that we'd built. I was waiting to turn into Weathersfield, when, and I could hear this noise in the distance. This is early morning, about half past seven. And I could see this car coming towards us at a huge speed, silver. And I knew it was a Ferrari. Got close, I knew it was a Ferrari 275 GTB. And I thought, oh, what a car. So I spent the day thinking about it. Six months went by, still in the Elan. I'd finished working at Weathersfield, and I was getting petrol at a garage in Finchingfield, a Jesmond garage, and I noticed that that Ferrari was in there having a new bumper put on the front where a tractor had reversed into it. So I said to Cyril, who owned the garage, if that car ever comes up for sale, I'd be very keen on making an offer for it. Gave him my number, thought nothing of it. A few months later, Zero rings from the garage. 
Oh, he said, the local farmer who owns that car, his name is Ian Yates, wants to sell it. And I said, how much does he want for it? He said, well, I'm afraid he wants £2,800. And um, looked at the car, didn't drive it. Gorgeous looking thing. Been parked in a garage for a while, so it was a bit messy. So we did a deal, um, £2,600. And I had that car for two years. In the interim, I had my first spat with my dad. And the reason why he wasn't involved was I didn't need to borrow the money from him because my granddad had died in 1962 and eventually we had a bit of money filtering through which allowed me to buy the Alans. I had this money and I bought the car and then I went to Swan at Leaven to show it to Dad. Mum was there and he was very, very cross. So he said, why have you got a Ferrari before I've had one? So that was his beef. Anyway, when I bought the Ferrari, I bought it home. Um, my wife was very unhappy that I'd spent 2,600 because our first house only cost 3,400. So she said, why have we got this, this, that and the other? So when I, I went to have it painted, it was silver and I had this f thing about all Ferraris should be red. So the chap who I rented a spray shop to at the garage said, can you paint this red? He said, do you know how much the paint costs? I said, no. He said, well, it's really expensive from Ferrari. I said, well, get the equivalent Ford colour. So he found Ford Monaco red for about a tenth of the price. We painted it Monaco red. But in the interim, while he was sanding it down, he rang me. It was a Saturday morning. I was at home. He rang and said, Governor, he said, this car is aluminium. I said, no, he said, it can't be aluminium. He said, it's aluminium. So I, went, I rushed up, saw that it was aluminium. It was right-hand drive, aluminium. So I rushed back home, I got my Ferrari books out, and there was only six in the world, right-hand drive, and this was one of them. So I thought, my goodness. Rushed up, told my wife, I said, look, we bought this car, the 2600, and it's worth a lot more, it's aluminium. Meant nothing. So um, that was really fortuitous, because I had no idea it had, had a, uh, it had been owned originally by Pad, uh, Paddy McNally, who started the F1 Paddock Club and had a bit of a, an affair with uh, Sarah Ferguson. So he's a quite a well-known chap, and I think he's worth half a billion pounds now. But So I rang him, I said, have you got a picture of it? Well, it was silver, and he hadn't, because by this it was red. I hadn't got any pictures of it was silver. So when I saw it at Tallacrest, it had gone back to the original silver. So um, that was... Um, you're quite a good story. It never, it broke down on me twice. I had a rear suspension brake coming back from work, which was relatively simple to do at the garage. And then I had a bit of a nightmare going to Brands. Um, there was a GT40 day at Brands. So the GT40 went down on a trailer and I followed in the GTP. And coming back, the clutch went to the floor. The um, slave cylinder had broken or something. It was pouring juice out. So. That was really the only time that it caused a problem. But, you know, in, in its day, it was a good-looking car. I had it two years, sold it for 4200 The chap I sold it to, another Essex boy, uh, he paid me the money, and then he kept it for years and years and years and spent a lot of money on it. And he sold that for 300000 They started to go stratospheric, these prices. And apparently a conglomerate of three people, including a well-known... British touring car driver, put money in and they paid a million pounds for it. But, again, this was late 80s, come the early 90s, we had the crash. And the car, as I understand it, was sold for 130,000. And the chap that bought it actually wrote me a letter, which I have, saying, you know, can you tell me a bit more about the history of the car? And I said, I will. I said, if you tell me how much you paid for it. So he said, yes, I paid 130,000. I said, well, someone's taken a big loss. Just a couple of, what, six or seven years ago, I saw the car for sale and I rang him and I said, oh, I used to own that car. Um, can we, can I come and look at it? And he said, well, you can buy it if you like. I said, well, I sold it for, you know, 4,200. Oh, he said, we want 2.2 million now. So, strangely, that was the subject of our first video with, with James. So, my brother, um, was studying at the Chelsea College of Automobile Engineering. And he used to come down at weekends with friends. He was, what, 18? 
And one day, um, his friend came down in a Cooper S. And I didn't really know much about them. This was probably 1968. The chap said, well, do you want to have a drive? So we went round our three-mile strip. And it was so quick. It's got no power low down, I said, but it suddenly kicks in. He said, that's because it's got a 649 cam in it, which I had heard about. So I thought, oh, this, this car is so nice. So we decided then, my brother and I, that we would build a racing Mini, an 850. And we started racing in around about, six, about 68, late at end of 68. And unfortunately, my first effort at um, Brand Hatch during practice, it landed on its roof and it was finished. So we had to then come back and build another one, which we did as an 850. They were called 850 Special Saloons. But the problem with an 850 was you had a saloon car race with four classes and you were at the back. So you were always running nearly at the back of the field, which was OK, but it'd be better to be at the front. So we then moved to a one litre Cooper S. We were sponsored by my brother's work, Hexagon, and we had a couple of really good years with that. And um, we, you know, we won a few races and that was sort of five years of mini racing that was um, you know, something, something really to savour. Mum was a Catholic. And she used to see us setting off in the, in, with the trailer. She'd come rushing out and we had to bless ourselves with holy water for the trip. And that, that's just how she was. Then uh, I said to my brother, who's still working in London at Hexagon, I said, if you see a Daytona come up, please let me know because I'm really keen on a Daytona. I've not got a Ferrari now and I'm happy to fill the gap. So he said, OK, I'll keep a lookout. And a few weeks later, he rang and said, oh, a couple of my... Motor trade mates who operate out of Warren Street have got access to a Daytona for sale. They don't own it, but they have access. It's in Kensington. Um, it belongs to a prince, Prince Nicholas von Preussen, who is a Prussian. And he's got it in his basement garage. You can go and have a look. He won't let you drive it. So I went up to Kensington and I got there before the two traders and went, walked up these steps, knocked on the door. Valet came to the door told me to use the downstairs entrance, so I went downstairs, opened the garage door, we went in, and of course this beautiful maroon uh, Daytona sat there, and it was just like a dream, really. So I, um, we agreed a price of 2,800. So that was that. I picked that up the February of 1975. On the way home, I'd never driven one before. It was quick. It was coming out of Braintree on the way home. I had about 10 miles to go, and I noticed there was a motorbike behind me keeping up with me, but I wasn't speeding. And I could see his white fuel tank. I thought, that is, that is a policeman, which it was. Anyway, he drove along, he rode alongside in this, uh, I think it's a Norton Commando. He drove alongside and he sort of went like this, as if he wanted me to go faster. I thought, this is very strange. Anyway, he goes off like the clappers and I chase after him, get to heading him, 30 mile limit, he stops 30. I stopped at 30 and he waves me goodbye. So that was a good start for the Daytona. And then uh, in the summer, we decided, my wife and I, or I decided, we would go to Ormskirk in Lancashire to look at a 365 boxer which had just been announced. And a chap called Stephen Pilkington, a member of the Glass family, had got it up for sale. I knew I couldn't afford it, but I'd quite like to look at it. So we went up. It was 240 miles, I think, each way. And my wife said, I'm happy to come with you, she said, but we need, I want to hear the carpenters on the cassette all the way there and all the way back. It's a cassette stuck to the transmission tunnel and you put in this great lump and it played music. I think it was called an eight track. I looked at the boxer and he, he let me drive it and it was absolutely gorgeous. And while he was out uh, fiddling around in the garage, I was chatting to a chap there who was in his Corvette Stingray who I later found out was Dave from the uh, Eurythmics. So anyway, come home, another 240 miles. And I thought, well, why we're on the M6? There's nobody about, no revenue cameras. And I think in those days, the police, to catch you speeding, had to follow you for an eighth of a mile at a certain speed. So it was only, I was only going to whiz up to near maximum and back. Wife was asleep, as she normally was, 10 minutes into a trip. I thought, well, I'm going to put my foot down. So I went quite fast and got up to a virtually maximum. And suddenly my wife wakes up and she said, well, what speed are we doing? 
use an expletive. And I said, look, 70. So she looked at the rev counter where it said 70. And of course, that was 7,000 revs. So we were going fast. And then she threatened to get out. So then I slowed down. Get back to uh, Sybil Headingham. And about a mile from home, we hear this amazing bang from the back. I thought, it's a puncher. Got out, looked. It wasn't a puncher, but I could see the tyre was deflated. Got back to the house, changed the wheel, and um, took it up to the garage the next morning. And um, sure enough, the wheel had cracked in half. It was just the tyre holding it together. So really, the speeds we've been doing, we were very lucky, and I think uh, God was on my side that day. So I got a new wheel from Marinello and, you know, back to square one again. But it's a, it's a, um, a happening that I'm not ever likely to forget. So I then had the Daytona and the GT40, but I was always, always hankered after a Mura, Lamborghini Mura. So I waited for the phone call from my brother. He said, you yeah, know, we've got a Mura coming in. We don't want it because it's... Um, you know, we're still in this petrol crisis, blah, blah, blah. So he said, but we can buy it privately. It's down for sale in Surrey, and the chap wants uh, £4,000 for it. It was a right-hand drive Lamborghini Mura S, 1970, of which there was only 10 made right-hand drive. And he said, oh, by the way, um, first owner was Twiggy, who at the time was a very, very famous model. So we went down to Surrey, and agreed to buy the car for 4,000 quid before we'd even seen it. So we took down a banker's draft for 4,000. It was green. She specified it Lamborghini lime green because it left the factory, factory line in white. So she had it specified Lamborghini lime green and orange stripes. The most recognisable mirror in the world. So we went down and saw the car on the drive. Key was in it didn't see anybody, knocked on the door, and a voice said, put the cheque through the door. So we put the cheque, it was in an envelope, put it through the door, and I said, is everything okay? He said, yes, off you go. So we drove back from Surrey in this mirror, and it was just a stunning bit of kit, and I think probably of all the cars I'd, I'd had, I think I would probably quite like that one back. Well, I could have it back tomorrow if I had the money because it's for sale in uh, Australia for 1.6 million. That was the Mura, drove it home, had it for two years and it was a very quick car but its brakes weren't that hot and the handling wasn't brilliant. Plus you had a, v, a V12 engine right behind your ear, just a few inches behind your ear, so it was incredibly noisy. So. We had that um, a couple of years. Uh, that was a great hit with the ladies. They loved it. I had a call one day from a friend. He said, oh, a friend of mine wants to go in your mirror. I said, OK. He said, I've just taken her up in my airplane. She loved it. Can you take her out in the mirror? So she came out uh, in her MG midget up to the garage. and So I took her out. And then she said, um, oh, she said, thanks, Mike. That was absolutely brilliant. And then, strangely, and it's never happened before, she took her pants off and hung the pants on the steering, on the gear stick. I thought, that's a strange thing to do. Anyway, that was it. I never saw her again. So um, that's one of my memories of the mirror, really, <laughs> which is quite odd. Um, so I, that we kept two years. I paid 4000 for it, and we sold it for eight. Uh, couldn't sell it in England, and it went to Australia. And the chap there bought it. He had it quite a few years and he went to another owner and he had it for probably 20 or 30 years and it was in a museum, in um, Birdwood Museum in Australia. So that was, a, that was a very interesting car, I must say. When the uh, Mura went in 1976, I had a bit of a hankering a year later for another Lamborghini. And perchance, uh, when I was at the garage, we had a chap who used to come around every couple of weeks to pick up tyres and batteries and exhausts. So he basically a scrap man, butler, can't remember his first name. And uh, he came in one day, this was the late summer 1979, and he said, oh, by the way, he said, um, you like Lamborghinis, don't you? I said, yeah, quite like them. He said, um, one of my customers, uh, the, lives the other side of Dunmo, has got one in his shed and he wants to get rid of it. Would you be interested? So within half an hour, I was up and away. And I went to this lovely house in Athorpe Roading 
and met this nice guy and he said, look, here it is. We've had it a long time. It's time for it to go. Uh, it's a 1968 Lamborghini 400 GT. Now, the speciality of this car was it was right-hand drive and they only made four right-hand drive. Hoopers in London, who are famous coach builders, were commissioned by Lamborghini to convert four cars out of the 247 to right-hand drive. And this was one of them, so it was as rare as hen's teeth. And he said, oh, he said, I want 6,000 for it. I said, oh, I said, it's a bit dear, um, because they, they weren't a popular car at the time. Um, and anyway, we ended up at 5,000, and um, I bought it home. Registration was SLF206F. And so got it back, wasn't hugely impressed with it, uh, the gearbox was a bit, take, took ages to get warm so you could move the gears properly. But we got it, got it back and um, the interior was a little bit lacklustre. So what we did, we got at the garage, we got some Connolly hide sort of replenisher. So you send off to Connolly's a bit, cut a bit of leather off from the bottom of the seat, underneath the seat, send it off and they'll send you back the right colour, which is what we did. And we made what I consider a very good job of the interior. So that was, uh, I'd had it about probably three or four months. And I thought, well, there's a chap was, was bugging me to buy it. And I wasn't that keen at the moment, I hadn't had it 10 minutes. So I then started to research the uh, history of the car. And I found documents relating to Abbey Road Studios. And I thought, hmm, this is interesting, because the only people at the time that I'd ever heard of uh, connected with Abbey Road with the Beatles. So a bit more digging and it appeared to have been owned by Paul McCartney from New. So he would have bought that in 1968. So um, a bit more digging and um, the problem with a car with celebrity attachment is they're all often worth much much more than they should be. But on this particular occasion there was no picture of McCartney standing by the car. So one then presumed, it was it his or wasn't it his? Over the years, it has virtually been proven it was his. But, so I had a friend, Nick Portway, who was a Vauxhall archivist. So he, 3098, the Prince Henry, he wrote books on them. And he lived in Watersham in um, Suffolk. And he said, um, when you want to sell it, let me know. So I had it about a year, did about 3,000 miles, that's quite a long way. And then he offered to give me a £1,000 profit on it. So I've got 6,000 for it, didn't owe me anything. And it was, a, you know, quite a, a nice looking car. So he had that for quite a few years. By then the cars were becoming interesting and he sold it for 85,000. And this would have been late 80s, yes. So he would have had that probably 10 years. So the chappie paid 85,000 for it. But come the early 90s, the prices crashed. They crashed everywhere. And um, he then sold it back to Nick for 35,000 pounds. So Nick now had his car back. He didn't owe him a bean and he had a good profit. So then he then sent it to auction uh, and it fetched 211,000. But we still hadn't got proof of the celebrity attachment. I believe that came later because it then went to Goodwood members meeting with Bonhams and that uh, didn't sell. So what has happened, I don't know, but I think probably today the car's worth about 650,000 because I see Simon Furlong has one for sale in Kent and he's asking 650 and it's a right hand drive, but it won't be a McCartney car, obviously. So. We don't really know. We presume it was McCartney's car. Apparently, there's a quick shot of it in A Hard Day's Night in the film, just drawing out from behind a bus. And that's about as close as we can get. It was dark metallic maroon. So um, I think, you know, as time goes on, it will probably get up to, you know, um, you know, a bit more expensive. But I thought for the money that I paid, I thought that was, you know, quite good value. Brighton Speed Trials was an event held in the second or first or second Saturday every September and you drove along the Madeira Drive which is like a promenade in Brighton and two of you started one kilometre 
fast as you can go and you're timed over that kilometre. The problem was if you had a really quick car, you couldn't stop at the end. So people were backing off in the Formula One stuff because you just wouldn't stop. There's a concrete wall at the end, which you either hit or turned right and you went into the sea. So you had to be very, very careful. That um, they kept the kilometre strip for until 1992, when it was then changed to one car at a time and a quarter of a mile. And that was probably a more sensible way of doing it because the cars have got so quick nowadays. So that was Brighton. Then um, a next Ferrari, a chap rang me from Bilderston in Suffolk. His name was Paul Bird. And he said, oh, Michael, could you get me a Ferrari that will increase in value so I can pay my kids school fees? <laughs> so I said, well, I'll have a look around. And there was one I got wind of, a Ferrari 365 GTC4, which was basically a Daytona engine, detuned to 340 brake, I think, but it had power steering and it was what I call a touring car. And for some reason, it had the horrible expression, it was known as the hunchback, which I thought was rather odd because it was a nice looking car. I found this car at South End Airport. Mr. Bird had said to me, I can spend 6,000. So I bought it for five. Registration OOV1, which even today, would be worth a few bob. And um, so I got the car back. I used it for probably three or four months to make sure everything was in order. I put a new exhaust on it, which cost an absolute fortune. So uh, my thousand pound profit almost disappeared with the exhaust. Mr. Bird had that. And what happened to whether he paid his school fees, I don't know. But unfortunately, not many years later, he died, which is rather sad. And then strangely, a couple of three weeks after I bought the car, the chap rings up and said that I bought it from, I want the registration number off it. I said, what, OOV1? He said, yeah. I said, well, you can't. I said, because we've signed a contract. OOV, OOV1 is on the contract. You know, you can't have the car back. So he kicked off a bit, but nothing else happened. And then strangely, two years ago, I saw OOV1, the same number, on a recreated DB4 GT Zagato in London belonged to Paul Michaels. So that was strange. So that was the end of the GTC4. So when Mr. Bird asked me for a car that was going to increase in value, I thought, well, it's got to be a Ferrari. Because in those days, I mean, I think they only made like 500 365 GTC4s. And of course, if you have a very low production, chances are the cars won't drop in value. In fact, they will increase in value. And that's the big difference today. In fact, um, at the end of my conversation, you'll hear about my 360, which in three years dropped from 88,000 to 53,000. So things have changed a lot. But in those days, it was very, very different. These cars were made in hundreds and therefore they did hold their value. The other big difference in those days, there wasn't ready finance available because I had a garage from 71 to 81. And if somebody wanted a car on higher purchase, they had to put down a third and they'd have to pay the two thirds off at the end over three years. So in that case, that was a three year agreement and the, the instalments were quite high. Now, of course, you can lease a car and you know, most of these Ferraris on the road, I'm sure are leased now, the new ones, 1500 pound a month, and you've got yourself a Ferrari. So things were very, very different in the buying department and the selling department. I think the joy of owning a Ferrari in those days was that you could maybe go a year or two years without even seeing one. And I was in the very fortunate position that because I had my own garage, I didn't have the monstrous service costs that the dealer would want. So in a way, I was very, very lucky. And I think probably owning the garage for 10 years probably saved me a huge amount of money because they very rarely went wrong in those days. And when they did go wrong, they were quite simple to um, repair. I mean, I had a, a clutch in the Daytona Go, and that was quite a simple job, you know, because I think, if I recall, the gearbox was on the back axle, so all you had to do was pull off the bell housing, stick a clutch plate up, and I think we did it in half an hour. And um, so in that case, they were much simpler to look after. You opened the bonnet, and there was masses of room all around the engine. Now, of course, they're absolutely crammed. Summer 76, I thought, well, maybe time for the Daytona to go, but I couldn't sell it in this country. Uh, there was a petrol crisis, there was an energy crisis. Nobody wanted a car that did 10 miles to the gallon. 
the only way I could sell it was to Australia. So I sent, sent it to um, put adverts in Australia. Somebody saw it, a chap called um, Philip McMaster, his name was. And he bought the car. The car went, it was a bit of a pain to get to Australia. I had to take it down to Tilbury. Um, it was, it was a sterile, sterile washed and then put in a, a um, container. It landed in Australia, it was inspected. And I think you couldn't just pick it up. It was parked up there again. So that was about two weeks later. And then suddenly a uh, knock on the door on a Sunday morning, two chaps in suits. And he said, oh, we're from uh, HMRC. Australia and he said we're just checking on the value of a car you sent to a Mr McMaster in Sydney I said yeah he said uh, we have it down as 3,600 pounds and I said that's correct he said that to us is too cheap could you prove to us that that was the money that you got which I could via a, a bank statement I said, there it is once they saw that they were happy had a cup of tea and then off they went so that, that was a, that never happened to me before that the Daytona had gone my brother rang, he said, we've got a Ferrari 365 GT 2 plus 2 that we don't want. Um, it's £2,200. What do you think? I said, yeah. He said, I haven't got a Ferrari, we'll have it. So I met him in a village called Takeley nearby, because you couldn't, there was no mobiles then, so everything was operated through a phone box. So I said, I'll get to the phone box and ring ring another phone box where you were. It's just crazy it was. Anyway, we met up, I picked up the car, and it wasn't that... Didn't, I never loved it, um, not because it was slow, it was a V12 at the end of the day, but it was just quite a big car, two seats in the back, and um, I probably did a silly thing. I got the magnesium wheels polished, um, so it, they literally shone like chrome. And on my first visit to a Ferrari Owners Club do at near Woburn Abbey, a chap came over, looked at the car, and strangely, he said to me, are you from Essex? And I said, yes. He said, I thought you were. Look at the wheels. He said, they're a disgrace. And I was upset a bit. It's a stupid thing for him to say. So I just got in the car and came home. So um, I thought, well, I don't need it anymore. It was very, very difficult to get into second gear. I do remember that you know, double de clutch, you couldn't get into second gear. Like a lot of Ferraris, you can't get them into second gear in those days until the oil was hot. So um, that went, I got a few hundred pounds profit. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm glad of out of it because I didn't really want it. I sold my Mura in uh, 1976 and my brother bought his Mura in 1978. So he was quite young and I wouldn't drive it. It was left-hand drive. It was an awful, awful car. But he said, oh, no, you know, it goes well and it stops and starts. And I said, yeah, but it's, it's dangerous to drive. It just didn't feel right. Two years ago, I was approached by Simon Kidston's company that were making the Mura register. Every Mura made, 762 made, were all going to go in a register. And I helped with mine, and I said to the chap, who was the researcher, I said, what about my brother's car? He said, I know this car. He said, it was number 12 off the production line. I said, but it was just an awful car. So the next thing I know is I get this picture of a crashed Mura, which was in actual fact my brother's car that had been damaged three or four years before and the driver had been killed. And it was just a total and utter wreck. And I felt in a funny sort of way vindicated that I said the car was horrendous, and it was, and there was a reason why. So where that car is now, it was rebuilt again in the 2000s, probably re rebuilt to a new spec, and it's probably fine now. But that was, um, yeah, that, that was a sad car. So we're, we're, we're now, the 365 GTC4 went, and uh, a chap, um, Stephen Pilkington, rang me, and he said, the 365 Berlinetta Boxer, he said, that car you looked at, M registered, it was at, what, 74, um, is up for sale. What do you think? I said, I'll come up. And we're talking now probably 1978. And he said, if you want the car, come and have a look. It's £12,000, which was a huge amount of money then. Um, so I did roar up and look at it, although I'd seen it once. And I said to him, yeah, you know, we'll do a deal. So I stayed up overnight, 
went to Barclays up there in the morning and that was a procedure to get a banker's draft for 12,000 when it wasn't your local bank. But we, we did, we got there in the end, it took half a day. I'll always remember driving home because Pink Floyd had just bought out an album called Animals. And this had the eight track system in it. So I put Animals in and I had it all the way down the M6. And I've always, it was so loud. And I always remember, always reminds me of that car. When I hear it on the radio now, I immediately think of the boxer. So I came back in that, um, I had that about a year. And a friend of mine who lived in Sudbury um, said, oh, when that box is up for sale, I'm quite keen to have it. So I said, well, you can have it now if you want. So he said, well, I can't pay for it for three months. I said, OK. So I had in my head that in three months' time, the car would be gone. My second visit to the Brighton Speed Trials was in the summer, or well, September, 1976. It's always in the first or second weekend of September, and it's always on a Saturday. So I went down with my wife. She said, yes, I'll come with you if you can drop me off at the lanes. Now, the lanes in Brighton apparently is a load of roads and roads full of boutique shops. So she was happy to do that. And then, so on the Saturday morning, we come out of the hotel and there was a little bit of a stutter in the Daytona engine. And I thought, oh dear, this is all we need. So I took her into the town, dropped her off and it started to stutter. I was losing a cylinder or two. And when I went to Madeira Drive, where the actual track starts, uh, a very nice policeman said to me, he said, you sound as though you've got a bit of a problem. I said, yeah, I do have a problem. I said, I think I've lost one or two cylinders. I'm only running on 10 cylinders. He said, well, what will cure it? I said, well, I can't, I need a run up the road at fairly high revs to clear it. He said, leave it to me. So there's a patch, a little bit of road above Madeira Drive, probably 400 yards long. He stopped the traffic both ends. And I went up one end and down the other, and I really gave it some revs, and it cleared. So when I got back, to the start, I thanked him. I said, oh, thanks for that. I said, because that was, could have got a bit embarrassing. So that was the bit I remember about the Daytona. That was my second visit to Brighton. My third visit was in around 78 when I took the Berlinetta Boxer down. And again, no problem, because it's a flat 12, and for some reason it never, never missed a, a beat in the two years I had it. But on the way down, an interesting thing happened. We were driving through uh, past Gatwick, a bit of dual carriageway. I look in my mirror and there's a boxer behind me, keeping a distance, maybe 200 yards, and we were doing probably about 100. And for a Friday afternoon, there was absolutely no traffic. So we went a bit faster and then we went a bit faster. And this car was keeping like 200 yards behind, perfectly safe, but we were going quite quick. So we got near to Brighton, I wanted petrol, so I drew into the petrol station. And believe it or not, the Boxer, which was a 512 that was following me, mine was a 365, so went the other side of the pumps. And a very attractive woman got out and filled it up with petrol. So after I'd filled up, we had a chat in the um, kiosk where we had to pay. And I recognised her, and she knew I recognised her. And she said to me, and it was so funny, she said, you won't tell my dad, will you? The speed we were going, I said, no, of course I won't. I'd never met your dad. I'll never meet your dad. You know, he's a world-famous bloke. So um, then I said, well, do you want to chat later? So we agreed to meet at the um, Grand in Bright, 8 o'clock in the evening. So I thought to myself, I'd better do a research. There was no Googling or anything at that time. So you had to think, where, did I, where have I seen her? In the old days, I used to read the Daily Mail before it became full-on gutter press. And there was a page in there called the William Hickey page. And this was one of these awful pages where some bloke discusses what the socialites are up to. A bit like they're Towie people now, but in the old days they were, you know, quite well off. And, uh, and I knew that I'd seen her in there. So um, I thought, well, we can chat about that with her at eight o'clock tonight when we meet at the, uh, the Grand. But knock on the door of my room uh, about half past six, saying that, unfortunately, I can't mention her name, can't appear. She, she's got to do other things. So, so that was the end of that. But that was um, quite an interesting uh, speed trial. I can't remember what, 
what speeds I got up to in the box. It was quite quick. And, um, but that, that was my last um, speed trials. And I think of the three that I did, I was very lucky to take part because it was amateur. Everybody was friendly. There were some fantastic cars used to turn up that maybe only came out once a year. So I think I was very fortunate. Then at the garage one day, my insurance broker rang and he said, uh, Michael, I want you to help out a client. He's got a Ferrari 512 boxer that won't start. It's full of water. So I said, OK. So I went over with my mechanic, Ron, to a place called Hutton, which apparently is the posh part of Brentwood. We went up to drive, black boxer, unbelievable looking car, black boxer, gold wheels, limited edition that was, present, was, was created by Coopers of Leicester, who were Ferrari dealers. It was absolutely stunning. I thought, oh, crumbs. Anyway, bonnet up. And what happened was the chauffeur had wanted to clean the engine and he'd used a hose pipe on the engine, sprayed it all over the engine, of course, it wouldn't start. My uh, mechanic, Ron, took all the plug leads off and there was a huge bunch of plug leads. There would be 12 plus one in the distributor. That's 13 leads. I thought, crumbs, how is it all going to get back together? So we went into the house with the chauffeur. I never saw the owner. The lady came to the door and I recognised her immediately because I'd just seen her in a film. But she made us a cup of tea, each of us, while we put the plug leads in her arga. So um, we got the... Uh, everything working, fired up straight away, and I said to the chauffeur, I'm going to take this up the road because, um, you know, it may not work. And um, so we went up the road, we went out towards Orsett, halfway house, I think it's called Roundabout. We went round this roundabout three or four times. The car was sensational. It was so much quicker than my 365, and it held the road just incredibly. We went round this roundabout, round and round, and Ron said, what are we doing? I said, oh, this thing is just amazing. So I went back to the house, and I said to the chauffeur, rather stupidly. I said, if this car ever comes up for sale, could you get your man to let me know? Two months later, he rang and he said, the 512's got to go. I didn't know at the time that there'd been a bit of aggravation. So um, I said, okay, and I think uh, I had to pay 14,000 for it, which I hadn't got, because I'd still got the 365. For, I'd had it for, I'd going to have it for another month before I got my money. So I had to borrow, because we used a finance company at the garage called Chartered Trust. And I said to Des, who was the manager, look, I need 14 grand for a month. And I was paying off a huge amount every week. Eventually, my friend in um, Sudbury bought the Boxer and my 365. I had the 512, um, which I now own fully. And um, it was just... Uh, it's such an incredible bit of kit, and I went so fast when I picked the car up from down the A12 uh, past Mount Nessing. We were going so quick, and I thought, blimey, I've got to be careful here. And um, I kept that, the 512, uh, for about another year. And the chappie, my friend who bought the 365, said, I've got a home for my 365, can I borrow your, buy your 512? So I said, yes, you can. So he bought that, and... Um, I think I made about a thousand pounds, which was okay because it hadn't cost me anything. But that black 512 was probably probably the prettiest car I'd ever seen. It was absolutely sensational. So that was that. So I was without a Ferrari again, and then something quite strange happened. I was at home on a Saturday night. The phone rang. Now, if a phone rings at ten o'clock at home, you know there's problems. And it was my insurance broker again. He said, oh, Mike, he said, um, I need your help again. I said, What's, what is it this time? He says, well, one of my clients, his Ferrari 308, which is quite, I think it's only a couple of years old, won't work. The clutch has gone to the floor and he's in a bit of a difficult situation. I said, oh, tell me about it. He said, well, you need to go and pick the car up. You need to take a car on the trailer with you let him have that and bring back the 308. So luckily, a, a local farmer kept his Range Rover and trailer in my yard at the garage. And the, the deal was, if ever I needed it for a, for a breakdown, let him know and I could, you know, I could use it. So off I set into another county. And I got to the 308, red 308, and 
there wasn't just one person, there was three people in it. And so I had my, my main man, the driver, who I didn't know, and there was two girls in the back. And the back is very small. And I think they can be described as ladies of the night. Very pretty girls. They didn't speak. He didn't speak. And I'd been told by my insurance broker, again, no lies, no pack drill. He said, but he will make it worth your while. <laughs> so I, uh, I load up the, um, uh, the Dino, let them have my Vauxhall Amiga. Off they went. Nobody spoke. They did not say a word, which was probably a good idea. So I get the car back and the clutch cable had broken. And on a 308, it's about 11 feet long. It goes to the front, round your pedal, under the floor, right to the back. So that was a long job because I think we had to remove a bit of the floor. And anyway, I did that on the Monday. And um, then my insurance broker rang again and he said, oh, by the way, Mike, can you get all the paraphernalia out of the boot, put it in a bag and take it down to the tip? But we'd already seen, we'd already seen what was in the boot and none of us had seen anything like it. So I put all this stuff in a bag and probably hundreds of pounds worth and took it down to the skip and that was the end of that. Then um, he said to me, um, use a car for six months. So I had that car for six months and why they wanted me, why they wanted the car away from them for six months, I'm not sure, but I can only guess. So I had that car for six months, and in the interim, I said to Dad, there's a 308 I've got here, I think it might suit you. So I went up to Suffolk, where he lived in Bretonham, showed him the 308, he drove it, loved it. So he said, I think what I'll do is I'll buy that to go to my son's, that's my brother's, wedding in Bath. Now, Dad would not go on motorways. And what he used to do before he went on a long trip, he used to write to the AA and they sent back a map. No sat nav, no nothing. So you had to wait for the map to come back and then you'd set off. So we found a 308 at Lancaster's in uh, the Ferrari dealers in Colchester. I think it was 5,500 and very little mileage. But the reason why it was quite cheap was it was white um, and white Ferraris not, weren't really the, all the rage then. Dad was in a car park in Berris Nevins on Angel Hill in the Mura, 1976. And Mum had gone off shopping, he sat in the car in the car park. And a lady came along, tapped on the window, oldish lady, and she said, is this your car? And Dad says, yes. She said, this is the most antisocial car I have ever seen. Dad was a shy guy, and for someone to say that to him, OK, it was Lamborghini Lime Green, it had orange stripes, um, but he was very upset that this woman had said this to him. So he took it back to Bretnam and rang and said, boys, we need to get rid of this car. I've just been approached by a lady who says it's antisocial. Can you look out for something else for me? So we were a bit sad. Um, so the car went to Australia and we bought him a Type 14 Lotus Elite, which he absolutely loved. Constant tinkering, but he loved it. So that was 76. He had it a couple of years. And then we had the opportunity to buy a Ferrari Dino 246 GTS that was wanting to be part exchanged at Lancaster's, but the chap wanted too much money. It's about 5,500. So I met him in Colchester and I didn't like him, but I liked the car. So we bought that car for dad and he had that car for a couple of years. He absolutely loved it. He was getting a bit older, so this was going to be really his last, you know, quick car before he went, slowed up a bit. So I liked the car and Perchance there was a, uh, a yellow one that used to pass through, past the garage on a regular basis. So I found out whose it was, and its registration was one KVW. So I always remember the registration. So I found out who it was, and spoke to his son. I said, "If your dad ever wants to sell that car, I'm quite keen. So I've known it from new, and I'm quite keen to buy it." And so in about '83, 1983. I uh, bought the car, it was £4,000, but it was awful. 
Um, it had electrical problems. It had problems one after the other. So I had the opportunity to sell it to a chap who I knew. I said, look, these are the problems. It's starting to get rusty. So he, he bought it and spent an absolute fortune on it and lost money. So they were the two Dinos, um, incredibly attractive looking cars, and they're up now the 300,000 mark. Um, but they didn't have a Ferrari badge on. They, you know, they were Dinos and that was it. But at the end of the day, it was a Ferrari. And it, was, uh, it was good. I started to get showing interest in Porsches, which I'd never really um, had an interest in before. But there were, one came up for sale in Oldham. And I'd never been to Lancashire before. I went up one night and looked at this car. It was black, in the dark, nice chap. And um, we agreed a price of 5,500. So I went up the next day with a friend and we bought it back, paid for it, bought it back. And I wasn't that impressed with how fast it was. So when I got back to the garage, I said to one of the chaps, I said, can you just have a look at that car? It doesn't seem very quick to me. So he took the back up and he started fiddling around, twisting the distributor. So, and suddenly it, the tick over from sort of 600 went to 1,000. I said, that sounds better. So I took it up the road afterwards and it was just so quick. Um, and I kept that for um, a year. And then the local Porsche dealers, Lancaster's in um, uh, Colchester, offered me an amount for it that gave me a small bit of profit. Following on from the um, RS, I then moved to a turbo, three litre turbo, which was a completely different kettle of fish. It was so fast, but that did not make any money. Um, I think I paid 11,000 and I think I got 12 back, plus I'd had to run it. But it was a quick car, you know, huge power. Um, so that really was, they were my, I had other Porsches of a lesser kind, but they were my two favorite Porsches and probably the RS was the most practical. I was at the garage one day and brother rang again. He said, oh, we've got a problem. We, we've taken in a Pantera that isn't as good as we thought it was. It's got rust in the back and we just want to get shot of it. And we want 2,600 2, quid for it. So I said, well, yeah, we'll give it a go. Because as a hospital job in a garage, having something there is quite nice. But basically the engine sits in the back and where it sat on the subframe was a bit rusty. So we took the engine out, did the rust painted it, it was silver, we painted it silver again. And um, it had a problem that it constantly shed fan belts, which were just behind your ear. I don't know what the problem was, but um, I wasn't in love with the car, I was in love with the looks. So my uh, chap who ran my garage in the workshop, Jeffrey, I said, you know, we need a trip out in this, where should we go? He said, I've got just the place. I've got tickets to see Led Zeppelin at Nebworth. Shall we go in the Pantera? So we set off to see um, Led Zeppelin, which I think was their last concert as a, as a full band. We went to uh, Nebworth, and, and I think Led Zeppelin came on at about one o'clock in the morning, I and mean, it was an inc incredibly long day. On the way back, I just, the noise was nice. It was a 300, 351 Ford Cleveland engine, which sounded really nice. It was a gorgeous looking car, but I just didn't trust it. Um, and I sold it for 3000 so I, I lost money on that car. Um, around about 1980, a customer rang and he said, I want to buy a Renault Alpine GTA. It's a V6. He said, I found one down in uh, Surrey. He said, can you go and buy it? He said, I've seen it. I'm happy with it. It's got a new engine. The engine had blown to pieces after 35,000 miles. He said, I'll, you know, we've agreed a price. Go down. So I go down, I pay for it, bring it back, and then all, do all the paperwork. But he was a you know, really good customer and he was never, ever turned down. He said, oh, can you run it around for a few weeks? Um, you know, I'm abroad. So I did um, and didn't, didn't really resonate with me at all. So I delivered it to him and about a year later he said, mm, I've had enough of it now. I'm not quite sure about it. And I knew what he meant. It was one of those cars that you got in and you weren't sure whether you are ever going to get to the end of your trip. I then only had one long trip in it. I was asked to a party in Kent by a friend of my girlfriend's and it was one of those ridiculous parties where you dress up and you 
chase around the house for a murder or something. I'd never done it before and it was not something I'd look forward to. So she said, I can't come. She said, can you bring my friend? I said, OK. So I went and picked up this girl never met before in Chelmsford. She got in the car and I could tell there was something not quite right with her. To me, uh, she was as high as a kite. Anyway, so we were chatting all the way down. And so we did this stupid thing around the house. And then she went missing. So I wanted to go home. I didn't, I knew her name, <laughs> didn't know much about her, but she'd gone missing. So I met another bloke who looked as though he was looking for somebody. He said, hey, my wife's gone missing. I said, oh God, where are they all gone? Anyway, we found them in the bathroom upstairs. We knocked on the door, come on, we want to go home. It's 12 o'clock, it's late. So the three of them came out and they could hardly walk and their eyes were really shiny and I'd never seen this before. Anyway, so we got her in the car, went home, M25, and whatever she'd been on had had a strange effect, but she became extremely amorous in the car, under her belts, and she came across to visit me. Um, and on her way, she knelt on all the switches that were down the centre console, and all the switches disappeared down inside the car. And I thought, oh my God. But nothing, no lights or anything came on. So... I said, you know, you've really got to go over your side. I said, I'm driving. We've got belts on, or I have. You know, after a two-hour trip, I was quite happy to drop her off in Chelmsford. But she later transferred, transpired that the three of them had been on cocaine, you know, where you snort lines or something. And it just reinforced my views that drugs are just absolutely no-no in, in whatever state. Because if you can change character in a half an hour, God knows what it could do to you. I was missing racing after the uh, Mini had gone, and in 1981 I had the opportunity to buy a Ford Fiesta to, to join in the Ford Fiesta Championship, which was run by Fords. So it was basically a Fiesta with an XR2 engine in 1.6, about 100 brake horsepower. So I paid, I think, 4,000 for, for this Fiesta, and loaded it on the trailer, and as I left, the chap said, oh, by the way, um, the cam is running an illegal camshaft because they were very fussy Fords about these cars being totally standard. And the first three cars of every race were checked. Why did he tell me that now? Anyway, he did. So I set off back and my first race was at Snetterton. And um, I came fourth and I, I was keeping up, you know, with the leaders, but it was new to me, I came fourth. And then I thought, if I ever come in the top three, they're going to check over the car, which is going to be a bit of a problem. So I did a couple more races. I think I did Mallory uh, and Lydon. I was keeping up. I thought, well, I've got to be really careful here. I was running fifth or sixth. Took the engine out and I got it rebuilt, had it blueprinted to the original Ford spec. And the next time I took it out, I, I was slower than everybody else. So all that told me was that they were running dodgy engines. So I did that for a year and had some good runs and Ford paid for us to go to Zolder in Belgium um, to race. And it was, uh, it was a good year, but it wasn't a successful year. It was costing 400 pounds a weekend. Fords were very fussy about the cars being in prime condition. So with the dents, it all had to be sorted out. And um, it was, I, I'm glad I did it, but really nothing was gained. The garage um, was going well. Um, I sold it in 1981. I moved into uh, vehicle leasing as a broker, which I did then for the next 40 years. That was really, that was my life ahead. But my big blow uh, and my worst year was 1985. My wife and I decided that we would get divorced. Nothing to do with her, all to do with me. So that was an incredibly bad year. So really, a lot of things went out the window. I lived with my friend Stuart, who used to run my workshop, and I realised that I hadn't got a clue how to run my life. First time I used a washing machine, I put whites and blacks in together, and I thought, I know absolutely nothing. I'm, I was quite down in the dumps. And um, I'd been dealing with a, a company in London who used to find me leasing cars, XR3s, uh, Peugeot, 
GTIs, which nobody could get, but they could get them. So I was buying quite a few cars from this company called Carbase in Greenwich. And I was talking to a girl on the phone on a regular basis. And we got on quite well. Um, so I was living on my own and desperate, really, to get going again in my life. Because I had obviously had quite a bit of maintenance to pay. I kept in contact with my two kids. I went to meet her in London. We got on really well. And uh, she was Uruguayan, but spoke beautiful English. And um, so that really was the next phase of my life was I moved in with her in London, Blackheath. And I then changed jobs in terms of I didn't work from home. I worked for my local Ford dealer in South Walden. And I was their F&I man. So I did their finance and insurance. Uh, they're called business managers today. They gave me a free office and they gave me a free new XR3. So I was quite happy with that. And um, things started to change a bit better. I got on well with this girl and we got on well. And I said, look, I don't really like London because I was driving from London to Saffron Walden every day against the traffic. So it didn't take that long, but it was a bit of a haul. Uh, plus my car was constantly broken into. So uh, we decided to buy a house in Essex and it was a we had to go for bid, we had to bid for it because it was a time when the houses, this is 87, the houses were going up in value and just because they were for sale for whatever, you had to bid up to get it. So th this house came up for 100,000 and we went to 120 and we weren't the highest bidder, but we hadn't got anywhere to sell. So we went, we bought this house for 120, uh, 20,000 deposit, borrowed 100,000 at 7%. Right, this was 87. 1991, the mortgage has shot up to 15%, plus the house prices were dropping. So we had a bit of a problem and it caused a bit of a, an upset between us. Um, and so we split in 93 and, you know, she went back to London and, um, you know, I then was in a bit of a quandary again. So I was, this is uh, 81, nine, so I sold the garage um, in 81, 82, started my leasing business, moved into a Ford dealership to, um, you know, help them, as I've just, you know, talked about earlier, Cleo's and Saffron Walden. And then I had a, a, a chap rang and said, oh, can you sort, find me a, a Sierra Cosworth? Um, so I sorted the money out and I said, I'll find you a car. So there was one up at Mike Young's at, uh, in Romford who was the Cosworth man. So I went up to pick up this Moonstone Blue 1986 Cosworth and it was just, it blew my mind. It was so quick. And not only that, but it was the first car I'd ever been in with a telephone in the car. And the telephone was, it was called a meter maid and you shouted the number at it, somebody answered and it was just brilliant. So that was my first, first mobile phone car, phone really. So I got this car back and I, I just loved it, delivered it to the customer, he loved it. And I thought in my head, I do need to get one of these, but I got, hadn't got much money. You know, the recently, fairly recently divorced and things were a bit tight. So I then found a car, a white car, at uh, Mike Young's, um, it was £16,000. So I had six and I had to borrow 10. And I never did dare tell dad that I borrowed money from a, you know, from a finance company. So I had that um, for a couple of years. I think I bought that in 1988, bought, had that a couple of years. And I made the mistake then of using it as a track car and tracking a car can affect it and we were down at Goodwood on a track day and it blew a head gasket. So I had to leave the car at Chichester at the Ford dealer for a head gasket. And my brother was there as well. And he said, oh, you can buy my, you can borrow my car to get back. And he was in, he had a Metro 6R4. Now, all very pretty looking, but a total non-road vehicle. It pulled left and right. It got on a white line. You couldn't get off the white line. It, it was quite hairy. But it got me home, and then uh, a week later I went and picked up the Cosworth, but I'd, I'd fallen out of love with it then. I thought, I'm not going to track it again. So I saw a, a, another Cosworth, a Rally Cosworth, for sale in Yorkshire, D74EYU, the number. 
And as I went up to see it, again, that was 16,000. He gave me 12 for, for my Cosworth. So I had to come up with four grand, which I managed. And I went to pick up this car and it was the Group N rally car was limited to 300 brake horsepower, but it just felt so much more. It was a gorgeous looking thing. And so I drove that back um, from Yorkshire and then I started to research it and I realised it was quite a well-known car. It was uh, Ford in 86 had got a competition to find a rally driver. And the rally driver, the first prize was they could use the car in rallying for a year at no cost. Ford would pay for everything. And it was won by a chap called George Donaldson and who I actually met a couple of years ago. So I used that as a road car, I think for three years, and it was just, it was magic, totally magic. Um, and that um, probably was one of my favorite, what I would call full on converted road cars. But I lost a lot of money on it, as it cost me 16,000. And at the time, so we're talking here, probably 92, 93, we were back in recession again. And we were noticing this because the cars that were being leased, people were sending them back and they weren't worth anything like the money owing on them. So it was a bad period. My mortgage was, has gone up sky high. So um, I lost about 6,000 on that car. And I understand that whoever bought it went banger racing with it. It was a total travesty of justice to, to banger race a car like that. But, it, it, you know, I, I did sell it and I had to. In 1985, I had the yearnings for a Ferrari again, and a local Ferrari dealer had a 308, it was a 1981 W Reg, a 308 GTSI with a detachable roof. So I went to look at it, and it was quite nice, it was red. And um, he said, oh, there's one thing wrong with it. He said, um, it needs a new thermostat. So I said, OK, it can live with that. But in actual fact, he told me a porky. It didn't need a new thermostat. It needed a new thermostat housing on a Ferrari V8. I knew it wasn't going to be cheap, but I didn't find that out until I got home. I went to my local dealer and I said, look, how much? And he quoted some astronomical price. I said, no, I'll do it myself. So I got um, a thermostat housing and a thermostat. And the two then, and we're talking about 1985, cost me £800. And... After that, I sort of lost interest in the car. I don't know why, I just got the hump about it. It wasn't that quick. Um, it, it had risen to prominence because of this Magnum PI on the telly. So it became, you know, one of the cars to have. I think I paid 12,000 for it. And then a friend of mine who I'd sold Ford Escort convertibles to in Walthamstow, a very nice chap, he had a jewellery shop called Capital Gold. I think his name was, if I recall, it was Alan Skinner. He said to me one day, he said, it'd be nice to have a Ferrari. So I said, well, I've got one here, actually, that you can have. It's cost me a fortune. I'm going to lose money on it. I said, but I'm, I'm going to ask for 14000 He said, all right. He said, sort out the finance. So I took it up to him. You know, he loved the look of it. And it, it was a nice-looking car. Alan had this um, Ferrari. He had only had it a few months. And he rang one day. He lived in Leightonstone, worked in Walthamstow. And he said, oh, Mike, he said, the car was torched last night. So from the beginning, that deal with the, the dodgy thermostat housing to the end when it burnt to cinders, it was just a bit, a bit of a nightmare. And that has often happened. And on this occasion, I was delivering with this chap, I was delivering him a new uh, Escort convertible, XR3i convertible. I picked it up from the Ford dealer in Malden and stupidly I went into place called Hatfield Peveril, crossroads, look left, look right, but I only did it twice. <laughs> when I drew out of the road, a car came quite quickly down on my right-hand side, hit the car and virtually destroyed it. And that was going to this poor chap. Anyway, strangely on that, this accident, um, the van that hit me, and it wasn't his fault, it was my fault, he had a, um, in his front seat, he had an Alsatian. The Alsatian came flying through the windscreen, lands on the car. And it was sort of shaking a bit. And strangely, 
a lot of people came to help, but not me. All they were concerned about was the dog. So I was left in the car with my feet trapped under the pedal. But that's an aside. The leasing business was going well, and I had a call from a well-known lady's PA in London. She said, uh, Miranda wants to buy a Range Rover. Could you bring one up? She got my name from someone I'd leased a car to. So I took this um, Range Rover up to Fulham prior to that because there was no mobile phone so they couldn't give you instructions along the way but she had said to me um, the steps up to the front door but I'm afraid you can't come in the front door you've got to go downstairs into the basement where the kitchen is she said I'll meet you there so I took the Range Rover it was a brand new Range Rover borrowed it from a local dealer and it was for Miranda Quarry now Miranda Quarry was Peter Sellers's second wife so I, I knocked on the front door, and, um, which I was told not to, and a valet came to the door and he said, I'm sorry, but can you go downstairs? But I only did it really to take the mickey. So I went downstairs and I saw, met this girl, very nice looking girl. Uh, in fact, she was so nice looking that she bought a Golf GTI from me. Um, so Miranda Quarry came down, who I hadn't met before, but I knew of, and she had a stick walking stick. I thought, oh, poor girl. Anyway, we bundled her into the front of the um, Range Rover and I then realised she couldn't actually see anything. So I said to the PA, I said, who's going to drive? I said, I'll sit in the back. I said, but you can drive. So she drove us round and, you know, Miranda liked it and, she, you know, she bought a car. But what was strange about that deal was... Um, as a customer, she was the first customer I'd ever known who banked at Coots, 440 the Strand. And I thought, you know, how are the finance company, which was Lombard North Central at the time, I wonder how they're going to react to this, because this is the Queen's Bank, should be OK. Well, actually, they reacted very well to it. As soon as I said Coots, they said, we accept her. And this was quite strange because in those days, to get acceptance for a lease or a finance agreement, you had to have a banker's... Um, letter to say that you could afford it. So you wrote to the bank, sent them a letter, it took three or four days to come back and the, uh, normally the best you could get was your, your client has an undoubted ability to pay. I've only had that response twice in my life. Second one down was considered good for payment. In other words, they do say he, everything's going to be okay. Third one down was should prove good. And this is where the finance companies would think about it because it's not saying the chap's not going to pay, but on the other hand, it's not saying the chap is going to pay. So should prove good was a bit iffy. And uh, the fourth one was appears fully committed. And then you knew that you weren't going to get it. But Coots, I've earned that. I think that's the only time that I've used Coots. And I think with Coots then, you to ha get an account, you had to have £100,000 in your bank account. It's changed now because I think now you do have to be worth a bit of money, but it includes property. And of course, £100,000 worth of property isn't a huge amount nowadays. So I don't know how it all works, but you definitely had to be worth £100,000 in assets in those days. I was asked by a customer to find him a Lister Jaguar. I knew Brian Lister quite well because he lived in a local village, but I didn't really know much about the, the cars that uh, were converted from XJS's. So I found one at uh, the Lister factory. The main factory has always been in Cambridge, but there was one that they did the racing cars down in Surrey. Uh, a chap called Lawrence Pierce owned it and he had the car for sale on behalf of a customer. So I went down to see it, dark green, about six, seven hundred brake horsepower, and we agreed a price of 53,000. It was a couple of years old, done very few miles, owned by a city banker. So we bought the car for the customer, bought it back. My son and I went down to pick it up. It rained on the way back. It wasn't a particularly nice car to drive in the wet. So um, I drove halfway, my son drove the rest of the way. We delivered it up near Peterborough. The chap's wife, for some reason, didn't like it. I don't know why, because um, it was a nice looking car, but she just did not like it and would not get in it. So after a month, we got the call, we need to get rid of this car. 
It was on lease, smallish deposit. And I thought, how are we going to get out of this? Because, uh, you know, with a lease from day one, you owe a bit more than, you, than you've borrowed. So we met, eventually managed to get rid of it by buying a BMW Alpina B12. This was a car that was for sale at Sittner's and in Nottingham, and it was owned by, that was Frank Sittner's car. And it was 112,000 new. And I thought, there's so much money. So we I did a deal and I think we paid, I think about 90 for it, but that was the only way we could get our money back on the Lister. So we did actually get the money back within a few thousand, but we'd then taken on an Alpina, which God knows how much was that going to drop. But, it, you know, it was a nice car. There was very few of them. And the customer's wife was happy with the Alpina. So he, he kept that for a, a year or two. And then he said, oh, can you get rid of it? You know, want to buy something else. So um, I found a customer in London who was a dentist. So I went up to show it in North London and um, went in, beautiful place. The girl said, oh, can you go and sit in the waiting room? You know, he'll be out soon. So I sat in the waiting room, sat next to Sarah Brightman, who I knew was a bit of a stage star. So I was chatting away to her. Um, that's what I remember about that day. Anyway, he did buy the car. Uh, again, more money lost, but we had got rid of it. Um, I found it, um, so I drove it for about a month while we were trying to sell it. Um, obviously the petrol consumption was horrendous, but it was a very large car, there's no doubt about that, a huge bonnet. You couldn't take it into car parks. But, you know, it was quite pretty and it was rare. The chap who we'd got the Alpina for decided he wanted a Ferrari 360. He had found one down in the West Country, so I went down, it was a, a year 2000 car, W Reg, uh, very low mileage, silver, gorgeous looking thing. So I went to, to pick it up in uh, the West Country, took it to him, and I thought this car is just so amazing, because it's the first Ferrari I'd driven since my 308, and things had moved on a huge amount. The Fiat money had gone into Ferrari, and this was just, a a really gorgeous car, and it, it just felt it was going to get to wherever you were going to go. Um, so he had that car 2002 to about 2004, and what happened at this time, when the cars were coming back from lease, I would buy them at quite a heavily discounted price, which I needed because that, 308, that uh, 360, that was 88,000 and we actually sold it for 53. So in two years, it had dropped that amount of money. But that's how it was in the early 2000s. And um, so that, that was just, you know, a gorgeous bit of kit, because I'd only driven the 308, I'd driven the 355, but this was another step forward. And I, I really enjoyed that car for two years. And the only problem, I suppose you could say, it I'd had a paddle shift, which I enjoyed. They were called them, uh, 360 modern at F1 with a paddle shift. And I suppose um, whether I would have preferred the manual, I don't know, but it was quick. It was really quick. So that was uh, two years back in Ferrari, but I, I knew deep down that would be the last Ferrari I would own. So the Ferrari went and then the uh, Ferrari owner said, can you find me um, a Porsche? I want a 996 twin turbo. So that would it was actually a 2002 car and we were in 2004. And the registration was a bit unpleasant. It was B1CHA. When I picked it up, the chap said, oh, by the way, um, it's had a conversion. And I said, well, what do you mean by a conversion? He said, it's got a bit more power. I said, well, a bit more than the 450. He says, yeah, it's just under 500 brake horsepower. So I said, okay. Um, it doesn't matter, I said, because we still would have bought it, but why he didn't say it before, I don't know. And then he produced a road test of the car, 202 miles an hour. I thought, this is a very quick car. So the chap had it about a year, and then I bought that um, and kept it about a year. But it was, it was so fast, and it was stable, the brakes were amazing, 
but it was so quick, it was impossible to keep, virtually impossible to keep to 30, 40 miles an hour. Not because it was intractable, it was because it just wanted to go the whole time. And I remember that car taking, going down to Bath for a weekend. I took my wife down to Bath and I thought that the dual carriageway going into Bath was a 70 mile limit, but it was a 50 mile limit. So I'm pooling along at 70 and then suddenly the blue lights behind me and he pulled me over and he said, do you realise what speed you're doing? And I said, yes, 70. He said, exactly. He said, but it's a 50 limit. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. He said, well, who do you think you are? Sterling Moss. And I said, no, Michael Schumacher. And that didn't go down well. And I got a speeding ticket. And he said, would you give me the ticket? He said, if you hadn't have opened your gob, you'd have got away with it. So another lesson learned. But that car um, was just a stunning Porsche. And I can't imagine a, a Porsche being any better than that. So we get to 2003, 2004, and a chap rings up and he says, oh, can you get me an Elise S1? Uh, red, preferably. I found one in Chelmsford, £12,800. So it was about three years old, very low mileage, hard top. And it had the 135 brake horsepower conversion at the factory, which was apparently another £4,000. So it was quite an expensive car. So I went to buy that and took it to the chap, and he couldn't get in it. Um, I said, well, you know, put your bum on the sill and slide in. But it didn't work. Um, I got him in to the passenger seat, and then he couldn't get out. So I thought, my goodness, what am I going to do now? Um, so he said, well, why don't you keep it? <laughs> I said, oh, OK. But I hadn't got much of a choice. So I had to pay 12800 for a car I didn't want. But once I'd driven it, I absolutely loved it. I picked it up in Chelmsford. I went along Essex Regiment Way. It was quick. It was handled like a dream. It was difficult to get in and out, but once you were in, it was just you know, stunning. So I had that for a year and then a friend of mine, he said, oh, when you want to sell that, um, Elise, let me know. So I kept it a year and I had my eye on a Series 2 because I know it's, it's um, blasphemous, but I think the Series 2 is better looking. So, um, so he had that and I saw an Elise S2 for sale in Scotland because I wanted one with cloth trim. I didn't want the leather. So I always found that you heat up a bit. So I flew to Scotland. Uh, I took two checks with me, a banker's draft for the f to pay off the finance and a banker's draft for the customer. Very nice guy. So I went up and uh, drove it back. And I had that car for probably eight years. And then something happened. I was diagnosed with cancer. And I had melanoma on my back, which they sliced out. But at the same time, they took out all of my lymph nodes from under my arm to check if it had gone further into my body. And I couldn't move my arm. So I thought, well, I'm never, ever going to be able to change a gear shift on an Elise because it was quite a sturdy bit of work. So I stupidly sold it to a chap in Holland who bought it over the phone. And I lost money on it. I paid 16000 for it and he paid 10. Um, but I'd had the years out of it, but now those cars are worth 24, 25,000. So that was my second Elise. Probably one of the best cars I've ever owned. It never went wrong. Neither of them ever went wrong. They had the Rover 1.8 engines. Never went wrong. Looked so pretty, and I just love that S2. And sadly, about a year after I sold it, all my arms started working again, and I thought, oh, what a pain. I've got rid of this car when um, maybe, you know, I shouldn't have done. Around the year 2002, I started organising charity events, raising money for our local children's hospice. But in 2007, we had our meeting, uh, 150 of us, in La Touque, beautiful hotel. And my brother came along, and during the meal, he started coughing up blood. So I thought, this is a bit strange. He was a heavy smoker, so nothing ever surprised me. And about six or seven months later, he said, I've got cancer of the esophagus, cancer of the throat. So I said, well, you know, you're near Charing Cross Hospital, sort yourself out, blah, blah, blah. Tried to treat it fairly mildly. But in the summer of 2009, he died. So a brother that I can honestly say that I'd never 
had an argument with, unlike the latest royal kids, never had an argument with him, and he was gone. So I went, I was with him on the Sunday, watching the Spanish Grand Prix in London, he lived in Fulham, and a Tuesday he was dead. And it was such a shock, because we knew he was ill, you know, we knew he was having chemo, but it happened so quickly. So that really was one of the, well, it was probably the saddest day of my life. But, um, you know, I coped, and I've said it before, that if you've had a strong upbringing and everybody's happy in your household, in the family, it does give you strength to deal with stuff like this. And that was probably, um, that was a shocker for me and uh, probably would never get over it. We had another, I had another disaster. So in 2014, um, Adam Brooks in Cambridge discovered I had bowel cancer, but it was stage two. So it was caught very early, simply down to their expertise. So I went in, um, they put me in this long tube thing, took whatever they do, the scans. And then when the scan was done, the doctor said to me, oh, would you like to come and to my office? And I thought, hmm, what's all this about? So, and he said, oh, he called someone for a nurse to be with us. So he said, we'd found some cancerous polyps in your colon, and not only do we want to cut them out, but we want to cut a bit of the colon out as well, where they were sitting. So I'd had a colonoscopy where you sit in front of a screen and watch this tube go up into your stomach, round. So, uh, you know, I could see what the problem was. Um, and he said, you know, do you want an operation or what do, you, what do you want us to do? And I said, I want you to cut it out. He said, well, don't you think you want to talk to your wife? I said, no. So we made a, the date, I went in, they chopped it out. I was only in there about, uh, how long was I in there? Probably only one night, but it, it was a horrendous night. So during this time, I thought, I'd been putting stories on forums about my cars which initially weren't believed until I started putting photos on. So I started that actually in 2002. So I thought, I need to get this in writing because a lot of people said, oh, why don't you write a... So there I was, like the Grim Reaper on my shoulder. I thought I'd better get on and write my book, the stories. So I started the book. Um, luckily, a friend of mine had a disc of all the stories I put on the internet. He got them all. So there was my book. All I had to do then was filter it out and make it into something. So I wrote the book. It was launched April 2016. And another great day in my life. We used a, a, a pub in Blackmore End, The Bull. And 400 people turned up. There was, there was Lamborghinis, Ferraris. It was absolutely magic. And, you know, that book sold really well. And what I said was that... Um, a big percentage of the um, sales would go towards the hospice in South End, And they've had up to now about 22,000 from my books. I chose the hospice in South End because my wife and I had been watching the television one night on Anglia TV and they showed um, the only children's hospice in Essex, which was Little Havens in near South End. So when we started fundraising, um, this is probably 2002, 2003, we decided that the money would go to them. And we, ha we had some brilliant fundraising charity sessions at the BRDC Silverstone. And our best year was 2008, just before the financial crash, when we raised 51,000 in a year. And so we've been, I've been supporting them ever since, really. So I took the manuscript in to the hospice. Bearing in mind, I was writing about periods 40 years before. And she said to me, the lady, she said, there's certain words in here, Michael, you cannot use. Because I wanted their logo on the front. She said, if you want the logo on the front, you've got to change some words. So she gave me a list of words I couldn't use. I couldn't describe my girlfriend as a bird. I had a lot of censoring to do, which I considered were a normal word from that era, but unfortunately they didn't see it like that. So I couldn't have the logo on the front because I didn't take all the words out, but I had a strip on the back page that said, you know, where the money was going. Twenty fifteen, um, I was reading Max Mosley's book, which had just been released 
called Formula One and Beyond because he ran F1 with Bernie for 16 years. And there was a book launch in London. A week before, I had been looking at the Bonham sale and I noticed there was for sale a Lotus Elite first owner, a Mr. Mosley from Manchester. Bonhams hadn't cottoned on to who the Mr. Mosley was. I had. So after Max had done his speech, I went up to him, said, oh, blah, 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 blah. I think your um, elite that you bought new in 1961 was sold at Bonhams last week. And he touched my arm. He said, what, 9364ND? That was the reg. I said, yeah. He said, how can we get it? So then I went to Bonhams and I said, uh, told a little bit of a porky, I said I was the underbidder and I wanted to buy the car. I should have, you know, should have paid more. So I spoke to a chap at Bonhams called Mark Gold, who was very nice, very helpful. He said, I'll alert the owner that you may want to buy the car. So he contacted the owner and he said, I'll get him to ring you. A few minutes after I'd sent the message, the phone rang and it was a chap from America, Maine in America. And he happened to, he'd bought the car, but he happened to be a classic car dealer. And he would buy cars in this country, take them to America, uh, do whatever's needed in America and then sell them. So he was quite happy to pass it on. So I said to Max, look, we've got the opportunity to buy the car. We're going to have to pay a bit extra to get it because uh, it sold at 58, for 58,000 at um, Bonhams. So then then began really my seven-year friendship with, with Max because the car has always been here. He's always paid for everything. Um, you know, I just store it and use it. And it was just um, a very nice friendship. We went to London. We used to go to the Hawksmoor near him to have a steak. I brought him down to um, Essex a couple of times, A, to check the car out that it was his, which it was. And the way it was proved to be his. He said he'd had a battery isolation switch behind the seat where nobody could see it. So he came down here, looked at the car and the switch was there. So it was definitely his car. So there was no argument about that. Chassis number 1649, which has shown up as his in the Lotus Register. So that went on. Um, a lot of money was spent on it because these cars always want money spending. And um, that car has remained here for nearly eight years. Max died, sadly, in May 2021. It's a slightly different relationship with the family, but sadly Max's wife died six or seven months after he did. So you can imagine, and it was an expensive will, and it, it'll probably you know, run for four years, the will. Max was keen to get the car back because A, he, uh, when he bought it, he went with his wife all around Europe in it, and I think it only broke down twice. Uh, he went to the, the Grand Prix around Europe. Um, he also picked up his first dog in it. Uh, so he had memories and, uh, you know, when we got it, he said, you know, I don't want this car ever to leave the family. So, um, you know, it's going to, it will be here for, you know, probably till I peg out, I should think. Um, we picked him up. I have a friend in London, Nicholas, who lives in Highgate, and he used to pick up Max and bring him down to a really nice pub uh, not far from here in Matching Green, and he came down probably three or four times, but he never, he did drive it, but it was just round the block and back again. So, and he tried it a bit in London, it didn't really work in London, um, because it's so small and all the cars now are so big. So um, it was an interesting, um, it, it was an interesting time, and I can honestly say I've never met a nicer, more generous chap. Looking back on my life, I realise how incredibly lucky I've been I was brought up in an era, you know, no mobile phones, no televisions, and we were very, very lucky to have probably the best parents in the world. I was lucky to have the best brother. So in that respect, looking back, we, I didn't really realise at the time how lucky I was. But over the years, as you see the world disintegrate, you realise, you know, maybe at the time I should have been more appreciative but nobody can really say what the future is going to hold. And, you know, through my life, I haven't had much adversity. But, you know, when I've had it, I've been able to deal with it. And I put that down solely to, to um, being brought up, you know, in a nice family home.
Um, I've, I've just finished my fourth book. I had the first book was Let Them Stare, second book, Let Them Stare Again. My third book was totally about the Lotus Elite, and it was, it's called Chasing Elites, and it came out in 2020, and that sold really well. And Max happily did the forward for me. Really pleased with that book. My fourth book um, is the story of the first 10 years of what I call the Royal Concours. These are Concours events he held every year at Royal Palaces. Um, started at Windsor Castle, then it went to Holyrood House, uh, Marlborough House, and now it's full time in Hampton Court. So I, I've, that book's just come out, and whether or not the organisers will take it on and, and promote it, I don't know. I'm quite pleased with what I've done, and I think it's a good legacy for the kids. Um, have a bunch of four books on the shelf. Oh, that was granddad's. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with how things have turned out. And I think I'm fit again. I have a cancer check every year. I'm due again in June. And I haven't got uh, a proper examination until 2024. But I don't think it's going to come back. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm fit and healthy. Um, I remarried in 2004. And, um, you know, that's going well. In recent years, I've had a collection of grandchildren. And I've, I spend a lot of time with them this afternoon. I'm going to pick um, Felix up from nursery. And I've told my children, you know, what my life was like. And I think I'm quite keen to tell my grandchildren because one in particular, Felix, he, he is a petrol head. I mean, he's two and a half, you know, and he'll, he'll walk by and say, you know, that's a Fiat 500 and things like that. And I think maybe I'm getting him in the right direction. So I dedicated my third book to the grandchildren, of which I've got coming up for seven. I've got another one due in a couple of weeks. I think the thing is now, as I'm older, as I'm coming up for 76, I spend more time with my grandchildren than I did with my children because, you know, in, when I went to work, I went out at 20 past seven in the morning, got back at six, very rarely saw the kids. So, in a way, um, my life, in a funny sort of way, has started again with, you know, with the children. And I'm lucky that, um, you know, they've, they're all lovely kids. But um, I think possibly I'll, um, you know, tell them stories. And I hope, you know, when they're a bit older, they'll, you know, realise how lucky I was.